action as part of United Way right now. That would be outside of our role as it currently stands. Uh, we did do a community consultation um, for new strategic planning um, in the fall last year, and transit transit came up as one of the priorities for the city, as was mentioned by many others. Thank you. So let's just pick up on pick up on that idea, and we are going to be talking about movement primarily in our next roundtable. But one of the reasons why transit is a priority is precisely because these communities typically are quite isolated from the core of the city. They're in areas where you do need to travel a significant amount of time in order to get to employment opportunities or to other cultural institutions. And I love the community hub idea of bringing those amenities in close into those areas. But at the same time, these, these communities are very they are very isolated, and unless they densify significantly, they'll continue to be relatively isolated. Would it not behoove us, and this is part of what I'm trying to get at with this question, to begin thinking about a fundamentally different model of integration that is about integrating newcomers into existing communities in a more substantial way? Is that, is that something that we ought to be thinking about? That's what I'd like to throw out as, as a question. Ranji, do you maybe want to take a stab at that question? Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll start with uh, a couple of comments and I'll talk about newcomers. What we have to remember is that if you look at the arrival city phenomenon in Toronto uh, with the number of immigrants in different South European countries, uh, these are generational items. So you can't solve something in 35 years. It takes 50 years to come in as factory workers, clean floors, uh, save the printer money, and uh, live uh, with a family for floors and old buildings in a system in the as Connors pointed out, that makes a renovation very easy because you get plumbing everywhere. But anyway, um, these families then uh, start picking up, so with their equity going up, they start deconverting their house and taking over, and the sons and daughters become engineers and lawyers and whatever else. So it's a generational thing, I think, and the kinds of jobs that uh, the people were used to get in the, in the 60s and 70s were really as a result of the growth of the baby boomers in the schools and the universities. So there's a whole different kind of expanding economy at the time. Right now, we are facing a very different economy. In the 90s and 2000s, we've seen the economy grow, but not jobs. So this is like the job that recovery is happening. So it's a very different kind of economic growth today compared to the 60s and 70s. Uh, the, the reason I say this is to contextualize what's happening with jobs, with people who come in, and as we saw from the uh, 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 chart that I think Joanne showed, where you have 40% of people with uh, university degrees, at least 30% uh, access to jobs. So there's a huge discrepancy with the two things happening. Uh, whether people live in these uh, areas or not, I think is not as critical. It's the fact that you provide the services to these areas. Um, the needs for these people are, are like the need for anybody else. They just happen to be at a lower income level. They come in and the next generation of kids will do better if we provide all the services. So the stuff that Toronto is doing the community hubs is great. On the other hand, um, what I look at from the 905 is, is, in very simplistic terms, the old city of Toronto has income, it's got jobs, and it's got transit. The suburbs, the inner suburbs, the pink areas that we saw on the map, plus the steel, has little income, little jobs, and no transit. The 905 has income, it's got jobs, but no transit. So if we can get the 416 to get access to transit to get to the jobs in 905, we give them a greater economic opportunity, which is missing right now. These people who live in these areas do not have access to jobs. And it's employment that creates economic uh, growth, right? So uh, whether they live in a concentrated area or not, if we don't have access to jobs and we don't have access to transit, uh, we're going to stay there. So I'm going to throw out a counterpoint, and I'm hoping that uh, one of my panelists will, uh, will, will pick up on this. Um, very clearly, transit is essential. The point that I was trying to make earlier about um, being better integrated in the city is really uh, driven by a key idea we have in our official plan around creating street communities, communities where people can walk to work, where they have amenities within walking distance, uh, where you can do most of the things that you need to do as part of your daily life within walking distance or a short transit ride of home. And what I struggle with in, in the proposal you're suggesting, Ranji, is this idea that we should be able and that it will be a very high quality of life to live in a different city than where we work. And no matter how you slice it, 
if you live in Toronto and you're, uh, if you live in Markham and you're working in Toronto or vice versa, you're going to be spending a really high portion of your life, even if you have state-of-the-art transit, you're going to be spending an hour and a half a day, and that's the best case scenario, an hour and a half a day sitting on transit. So this idea that we can have isolated pockets throughout the city that are one kind of community or one kind of a use is something that I think we need to struggle with as an idea. And in keeping with some of the, the comments that Joanne made around tower renewal, um, I think we really need to struggle with how we in fact take the existing communities we have and make them more complete so that people can stay in them. I, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. President, I think I gave the wrong impression. What, what I really needed to talk about is the fact that the people who are in these neighborhoods need jobs, and they need jobs close by. And what we need to do is change the thinking and the land use pattern and work somehow with the private sector bring jobs to those areas and, and, and make them, as you said, complete communities. If you look at the old uh, neighborhoods where there was Little Italy or Greektown or any of those things, they had shops and jobs and housing, everything in that area. We don't have that anymore. We created these isolated communities in the 60s and 70s where we really don't have jobs in the area. So, uh, absolutely complete community and that last mile home, walking from your bus to your house, has to be the thing that makes it key for a certain neighborhood. Do any others want to pick up on this, on this idea, Chris? So, I think that that would be an issue no matter who was living in the community. Yeah. It, it's a, a feature of the built form of the That's community, right. not the population living there. That's right. The fact that we're talking about newcomer communities who are in those kinds of built environments brings a, a greater complexity, also brings greater opportunities, I think, um, in how we look to address some of those challenges um, and looking at um, positive examples like Thorncliffe. Um, neighborhood uh, and how they have um, almost against the built form um, built um, a lived experience of a whole community um, within their neighborhood. What are the learnings there? What, what can we learn to support uh, and basically get out of the way of? Half the time I think um, we get in the way of communities um, coming up with their own solutions. So figuring out how to Whether it's rather than trying to bet the whole farm on on uh, hoping that some uh, a very different uh, transit system is going to emerge, um, working on the assumption that there is not that the transit problem is not going to be solved, um, and and looking at how well things can work that way. Um, one thing about Toronto is we tend to we tend to imagine it structured along the center periphery model that. Uh, that other cities, you know, the New York and so on, are based around it, and it doesn't quite work that way. I mean, the the, the, the suburbs of Toronto are as established and old as 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 Metro and and, and City of Toronto was. There 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 isn't a there isn't a later suburb uh, and an earlier city. Uh, and if you see what's happening in Markham and and in uh, parts of Peel region and and all these places, is you see the classic thing starting to take shape. You showed those pictures of those, what I call what I call one-story building arrival cities, these, these strip mall developments. They become centers of economic commerce. People go from one of them to another. They, without crossing through uh, the downtown core, when they do have forms of transportation available. Um, and Toronto's a little bit like Los Angeles in this sense, in that, in that, which also has crappy transportation and uh, immigration patterns which are generally more around the periphery now and, uh, and things like that, and those are unfixable there. And what they've realized is that the transportation that matters is not from centers, centers of periphery, but it's around the peripheral areas, uh, so they're in touch with, with each other. Uh, the Highway 7, it's, it's very interesting to see how Highway 7 is becoming the new sort of young street. Uh, I think there's a lot, a lot of activity in terms of uh, new Canadian commercial and cultural ties that happens horizontally along Highway 7 that ne never goes south of there. Uh, and I wonder if 
some of these power renewal projects to build up economies and commerce and and uh, functioning social life in the blank areas between towers can be built on the assumption that we're not going to solve this by having ultra high speed links to downtown anytime during the next uh, few decades and that maybe we should be building up integral employment and economies within these districts. Go ahead and roll. Yes, I wanted to comment on two elements I discussed a few minutes ago. Looking at the importance of religion in building and arrival cities. Taking Tonkliff as an example, um, having a mosque, having two churches in the community, those institutions provide balance, provide um, spiritual needs, and also provide um, a need of accession, and also, I mean, basically it's food for their souls. So really, it, it actually provides that food to the souls of many people who live in that community who belong to one religion or the other. Now, looking at transportation and transit for Tonkliff, actually, if, if come to see, I live in downtown Toronto, by the harbor front, but Tonkliff has the most traffic TTC commute in the, in the city. It has buses that go to Tonkliff from either Cape or Hawksville. But the issue is, do the people of the community have money to be able to afford, but, you know, to board these transit? Do they have the income to be able to commute from one end to the other? With three dollars per person, and the average number of family members in the community is five to six. That's the average number of family units in the in the neighborhood. Now, looking at using the example that we have, Foncliff has changed again, as as Doug has mentioned, that it has built its own internal economical sustainability with having Iqbal as one of the stores that have grown from a warehouse to a supermarket that serves 30,000 people who live in the neighborhood. And having Bamiyan, it's a restaurant that serves Afghan food, become a destination for people who live out of Tonkliff. So if you look at it, the neighborhood has created its own economical engine to serve the people who live in that neighborhood. And, and by doing that, they have eliminated the cost of transportation, they have eliminated the, the commute time, they in, eliminated the social isolation of people like myself, who is a newcomer and have to commute to work every now and then, and having a child who I drop off at school at 8.30 and see her back at 6.30 in the evening. By being able to work and live in the same neighborhood, you eliminate all that and actually create a neighborhood where people want to live in and have fruitful life after work. Thank you. So I'd like to, oh, sorry, do you go ahead? Yeah. Uh, I just want to touch base with the new immigrants, newcomers, when they come to this country. They face a problem. They don't have experience, Canadian experience. That's what all the small business say that. That's a big problem because we spend this whole life some profession, and you worked there, got experience, and he was accepted as an immigrant to, be, to accepted to become an immigrant in Canada. But as soon as he lands, he won't get any job right away. The problem is, what happens? Then he will not start working, so he's not making any part of the workforce. He will start trying to find a hard job to just to survive. So by the time we lost a one skilled worker, the category what he came. Then you start learning the new career, then you have to start from scratch again. So for the solution, what I did as a 15 year, I didn't have the problem. When I came, when I came to this country, I got a job right away. But whenever anybody opting a job in the travel industry, I used to give them a job. I used to mentor them. I used to volunteer the job work with them. I used to teach them how to do this work in the industry. Now, from my office, almost like 12 people, they started their own company. They're all successful. They are living better lives. So like this, you know, in the main thing is what I want to share here. All the small businesses, maybe government can come up with some kind of, you know, incentive program for all the small, medium-sized business owners or the professions, whoever is strong at that. They can give the mentoring service to their own community, wherever the city they came from, wherever the community they are. Because people does not go to all the government program. People don't know. What are the facilities? There are facilities, there are budget, but people don't get it there. So the, the main thing is if the communication, people can get the message, the newcomer get the message, we will make a better city and we will definitely make a more workforce to work for us. Thank you. So let's stay on that theme for a minute of jobs. I don't think we've, we've quite got at the religious uh, institutions question, but we'll come back to it. But let's stay on the theme of jobs for a minute. Uh, we saw some data from Chris Rillinger on the temporary foreign worker programs and the, the significant shift that's happened from permanent 
um, to temporary foreign workers. Is this having an implication in our arrival communities, and is there a potentially longer-term implication that we should be planning for and conscious of? I'll, I'll start if I look for help from my fellow panel members. Um, I, there's some interesting shifts in that we have um, a more labor market-driven selection, immigration selection regime. So we're, we're, the people coming into the country are more specifically, have a more specific set of skills. One would think that would result in a more immediate match between um, the newcomer's skills and their employment opportunities. That's not what the data is showing. Um, and this is a very different context to uh, historical settlement communities, um, the Italian community, Portuguese community was referenced earlier. Um, it's a very, very different settlement context. Um, and uh, that, that's a part of the challenge. We're working with our provincial colleagues, our federal colleagues, um, NGOs, to try to determine how we can do better. Um, but this continues to be a, a, a major issue. Um, and uh, the kind of mentoring um, that Abu was speaking to is critical, uh, and again, it's figuring out how we can support and facilitate that informal uh, kinds of connection um, for for greater success. Go ahead, Anne. Um, I, I don't get it. I can't really speak to economic development um, and, and jobs, but I think something to um, connected to the previous discussion is to think about um, really fostering um, organic um, community interactions where maybe um, so-called arrival cities or neighborhoods, they don't exist in isolation. They're not segregated, they're interwoven, they're part of the city fabric. And so I think it's really important to um, you know, really understand and, and create uh, forms for mutual understanding and for equipping um, newcomers to be able to make their own decisions and to be able to live autonomously and, and um, you know, and, and to have the skills and knowledge that will, will enable them to do that. I, I think, um, and that just comes with uh, time and, um, and support. And I think one of the questions we're struggling with is that if some of the infrastructure doesn't exist in order for those interactions to take place, uh, you're spending most of your life on a bus, traveling to another community, you don't have a lot of time to interact with the community around you, or if the amenities to facilitate that community-based interaction don't exist in your geography, they're, they're somewhere else in the city. How does, how does that happen? How do you have a strong sense of place and a sense of connectedness? We talk about the city of Toronto as being a city of neighborhoods. So coming into this city and being able to connect with a neighborhood and be a part of a neighborhood seems to be a really important part of uh, fostering that organic community interaction that, that you're referencing. Can you just speak to that challenge a little bit, Anna? Um, yeah. I, I think um, what's interesting is that there are there is, in fact, a very extensive infrastructure, depending on how you look at the city. Um, for me, um, this and working with the Civic Awareness Project and in the nonprofit community sector, it's really been an eye opener to see that this whole sector exists. And I think um, perhaps not everybody is familiar with um, all the different endeavors that are done by, for instance, the United Way, um, uh, the City of Toronto, um, the libraries, and, and other resources. So there are so many projects that are focused on uh, youth and, and, and newcomers and so forth. So there is actually an infrastructure. Also, the uh, federal government uh, provides settlement programs to newcomers, but oftentimes they're not really aware that these exist. So um, you've got programs like uh, Link um, and Settlement Services, but oftentimes newcomers say, "Well, you know, what is that?" And so it's 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 interesting to to say to newcomers, you know, to tell them to um, adjust and integrate, but. Um, how can they, if they're, if they're not aware of a map, 
even existing. So to even, they wouldn't even know to ask for that map, let's say. That's sort of the experience that I have seen um, in working in this field. So, um, but it is good to leverage what does exist. For instance, the library is a, is a very, very well networked resource. Um, and the city of Toronto as well. I mean, looking at um, uh, the community and, and rec uh, sorry, parks and recreation. Um, so there is a lot there. It's just sort of figuring out how to reconfigure it to adapt to the lived reality of people in these communities. I mean, Scarborough is a really good example, and it's really grown as well. And I think it's also important to reimagine our own narratives of these places. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not from Toronto, but I lived in Scarborough as a young child, and it's a, a very different place now. And I think it's important to not to reify these um, you know, spaces, but to see them as dynam dynamic and fluid. And, and it's going to change all the more because immigration is driving population growth and labor market growth. So this is our country, right? This is our, our reality. Well, and I think just to link that in with some of Joanne's presentation, uh, the community hubs are a way of making some of that amenity very visible so that you don't have to hunt for it, but there's actually a geography and a place where those amenities uh, come together. Did you want to speak to this? Yeah, did, I mean, this question about the temporary, the so-called temporary immigration, uh, which in practice rarely ends up being temporary. Um, it's not the first time Canada's been through this, uh, actually, and, and I think it, it presents some real challenges. Um, in the longer term, can't, I don't think in terms of employment mismatch, it's a big, it's a big problem. I mean, I mean we, we have more unskilled labor shortages, we now realize, than skilled labor shortages, which is why so many of, of the people who drive you in taxis have advanced degrees from overseas universities. Um, but I think in terms of larger community formation, it could have a problem. I looked at that. I, I did a chapter for Arrival City that I ended up not using, comparing the experiences of uh, Italians who uh, arrived after the Second World War and Portuguese who arrived a, a couple of decades later, asking the question of why, uh, in terms of educational outcomes and, and uh, economic outcomes and several other measures, the, the Portuguese had fared more poorly, even though they started off from the same economic uh, uh, position. And although there's a number of explanations offered in this, this, this popular topic, one of the big ones is, of course, is the Italians actually came as, uh, as full immigrants with a pathway citizenship. A large number of the Portuguese who came to Toronto in the late 60s and early 70s came on temporary visas or tourist visas even, and essentially eventually got citizenship by overstaying them and, and being normalized in, in, in various ways. And, and I would argue that part of the reason for the gap there is because uh, a lot of the Portuguese who arrived during that time, it took them much longer to be able to do things like buy houses and start legitimate businesses and all these things. And, and it, it crippled some of the ability to, to, uh, to form a basis of a, of a, of a tightly integrated uh, economic and social community in the same way. I think we need to watch out for the dangers of that problem. It, 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 you can find jobs for people, but getting people to be able to invest in the long term is a, is a much more important question. And unfortunately, I think this is a question for the federal government. Joanne? Thank you. To pick up on that a little bit uh, more, there seems to be a series of misalignments in terms of the, the skills needed for um, jobs that are available and uh, the skills that people have either through education and expertise. Either there's a misalignment is that um, we don't know about the skills or have a hard way of matching those skills to the job. Um, not having Canadian experience plays a big part um, and is a barrier uh, to that alignment as well. But we also have really high unemployment, especially among youth right now. 20% um, or just over 20% in the city of Toronto for youth, and even higher for youth that are newcomer youth and racialized youth. And so the alignment, we really have to pay attention um, to that. We, we do know that, um, uh, that the, there's a, a better fit for the skilled people jobs rather than the unskilled jobs, and part of that is a bit of a perception. We have a lot of youth that go to school here that maybe be born newcomer um, families, but youth are, the kids are born here and um, uh, go through school, but um, in fact don't even think about career post-education um, and where there would be jobs. And 
we need to pay attention to that. Um, and also there is a predisposition in some um, families and, and certainly with um, some youth today that uh, they want the professional positions and they don't want the, uh, uh, the jobs that are in fact uh, trade jobs, for example. So there seems to be a whole series of misalignments and we need to pay attention to some of that. Um, we have a priority of youth as well as neighborhoods and newcomers at, at United Way. And one of the things that we want to do is work more closely with um, the private sector, with some of the corporations, working more closely as well with um, the education institutions uh, to talk about misalignment and how in fact we can um, build a system that would um, try and do some of the alignment better. So that would impact all youth, but certainly newcomer youth as well. So I just want to link that idea into a comment that Doug made at the outset about uh, talking about communities like Penny Basin Market and one of the reasons for its vibrancy was that it was possible to form small industries and businesses that gave newcomers a foothold in the community and gave them a way to build some equity and to leverage that equity into becoming more firmly established in Canadian society. So linking that idea to what you're talking about, Joanne, or what, uh, this misalignment is it expectations? Is it that expectations have changed of newcomers and there isn't that same kind of um, interest in entrepreneurialism? What What is it that is resulting in not having that same kind of culture of entrepreneurialism? Surely part of it is, is the geography, uh, but from your in your experience, why the difference? You know? I think while well, we're in the, the process of um, studying and trying to get a better understanding of it. Uh, certainly expectations from some early work that we've done um, are different. I think um, what we've, we've um, probably informally heard is um, newcomers coming here with the expectation to be able to use their um, expertise and skills, finding that that's hard, um, and parents taking jobs um, that will support the family, but still having really high expectations for their children and building that in the kids as well that um, the kids, um, you know, I've heard a lot of newcomer families, um, and even with my family, my, we came to Canada in 1967, um, it, there was no consideration that we were going to be going to university. In fact, um, post-secondary um, was a must, and post-grad was a must as well. So I think there are lots of expectations built into uh, the newcomer families, um, and, and not necessarily paying attention to some of where it's first Entrepreneurship, when we look at the jobs that are being created, um, and when we work with youth right now and try to look at job readiness and job skills, a lot of the youth are looking at um, entrepreneurship, but not necessarily out of choice. They're seeing it as almost their only opportunity to start getting um, their foot into some work. Um, and if they had a choice, they would rather stay with some jobs and then move into entrepreneurship rather than most of the opportunities to entrepreneurship right now are being pushed that way. I think there's also a misalignment in terms of where the jobs are um, that pay well, um, being more downtown than in some of the suburban um, uh, neighborhoods and um, looking at needing to support smaller and medium-sized firms in the, in the neighborhood to actually connect more with their local communities and Chris, do you want to weigh in? And then, Abu, I'll, I'll, I'll warn you that I'm going to come to you on this question as well, just based on your experience. I think um, Doug Saunders touched on some of the differences between um, those neighborhoods like Kensington and modern or newer apartment um, community. Um, and it's not a matter of a difference in entrepreneurship amongst the people who are living there.
residential apartment commercial uh, designation and what that might unleash, the, the entrepreneurial abilities that that may unleash in those communities. So just before we go to a blue, what uh, Chris is uh, referencing there is in the change that was made to the zoning bylaw in order to allow commercial within our tower neighborhood uh, in, in, these, in these existing buildings. A zoning change that is hoped with a variety of other incentives and programs is going to unleash the opportunity for some of this uh, grassroots entrepreneurialism and creativity. Thank you. Uh, in terms of newcomers uh, coming to uh, we can create some kind of forum like a small mini workshop all the entrepreneurs in the area, in the community, uh, they can tell about how they came and how they achieved today, and they can see really motivation for the newcomer. Secondly, uh, they can, everybody can take it in the own area, um, or they can give them a voluntary job, or some kind of mentoring in the area that can develop it. Saying that, we are a small community in the North from South India. We have about uh, uh, close to four or five organizations so what we used to do, every program, even though it's a cultural program, community program, we used to bring some of the success, successful people in our community, either entrepreneur, small medium business, business, even running a Tim Hortons, whatever, we give them five, 10 minutes, motivational, inspirational speech in the community. So at the end of the time, they go and mentor with them, they follow the footsteps, like how, how they got into the business, how they developed it, that works very well. So uh, the, the main thing is uh, definitely it can be done because we have resources, we, have, we are already have these programs, but people are not getting it, what are the things available? Maybe uh, they didn't get the message, uh, because not everybody going to library, not everybody going to community center. So in other places, like worship places, for example, uh, going to mosque, or temple, or regularly people go as a weekly, uh, regular basis. If there is a place where they can get the uh, message there are, there are places, there are resources available for them, city is providing, and uh, where they can develop their skills, that will make a big difference. Because if, you, if, if people, newcomers start working, it is benefit for the city, benefit for the economy, benefit for the country. If they're not working, it's really a burden, like a, you know, it's a burden for the place as well. So maybe that may be a small idea. comment about our discussions of integration because oftentimes the the onus falls very disproportionately on newcomers to do the work to to settle and, and, and all of that. And I think that um, you know that's a very important part of the equation. But it's also important to look at um, how those channels of inclusion and participation are made possible for newcomers. I mean integration is actually a uh, you know, part of the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. It's a, it's a federal mandate. Um, but how are we living up to that to, um, to provide mutual support? Um, you know, and, and how much onus lies upon you know, the larger public to make um, those channels available? So I just want to put that question out there. And an important question, I think, in many ways, the key question that's driving much of our conversation today is figuring figuring out what our what our roles ought to be. Um, I'd like to shift a little bit um, to a question from Tina Mate. Uh, she asks, when redeveloping post-war suburbs, such as the example that Doug gave of Solarbus, is that it? Solarbus, I should be able to say that, being of Dutch lineage. Uh, how do you make sure that gentrification is mitigated and that the original communities are not displaced? And I think this is a really important question because we know that in communities, particularly our, our rental communities uh, today that are privately owned, as many of them are, that part of what happens with, our trans with the transition to redevelopment, and there's a lot of interest in redevelopment by private owners, uh, how do we ensure that we continue to maintain them as rival communities, that we don't end up displacing the communities that are there today? It's a really central challenge and, and question. Do you want to begin with that, Ben? In the broadest cosmic sense, gentrification is what you want to happen to mm -hmm. poor immigrant neighborhoods and a lot of things that help get them out of trouble spots where they find themselves involved eliminating barriers to gentrification. You want people's property values to rise because if they don't rise, they're going to 
fall. I mean, things don't, neighborhoods don't sit still. They, they decline or they, or they rise. Uh, you, you want the yuppies to move in. You, you, you want to have a mix. I, I, do think that, that, I do think that ethnic concentration is, uh, um, among new immigrants is a beneficial thing. It, it, it creates paradoxically integration. Uh, but on the other hand, you want to have a sort of neighborhood that's succeeding in a way that it's, that it's, that it's bringing in a middle class. You know. That said, um, this all assumes that these new immigrant neighborhoods uh, are places in which the, the communities of new immigrants have an ownership stake, uh, and in which case they can do well. In fact, one of the things I note is that uh, often in immigrant neighborhoods, in arrival city neighborhoods, uh, a rising poverty rate is a sign of the success of, of the neighborhood. Uh, because the first, the first group of immigrants, and it is a mistake, you know, the social service agencies always make this, this mistake, see a rising poverty rate, they assume it's intergenerational poverty and things are getting worse. In fact, what happens, the first group of immigrants move in, rent for a while, buy the housing, they get successful, they move out to a different neighborhood, a middle class neighborhood, and they rent out their housing to three families uh, coming from the same village as they did. Those three families are starting off very poor, and you're replacing one, one poor but now middle class family with three poor families uh, who are renting, and uh, what, so what, what, is, what is a successful escalator of social mobility appears on the statistics chart as a rising poverty rate. Uh, and the tools you need are not you know, social service agencies and, and, and so on, but rather technical training and the sort of things that Thornclip Park does. I think we look, Thornclip Park is maybe not the best example we have because it's a purely rental uh, neighborhood. It's a stepping stone neighborhood. You know, the people who live there, when you talk to them, they, none of them expect to live, their children to live there or to, to live there forever. It's, 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 a, it's a foyer, uh, a very successful one in, in Toronto. Uh, and there's a mixture. There's a lot of rental stock. Uh, there's a lot of owning, ownership stock. We shouldn't estimate, even in this housing economy, the desire of new immigrants uh, to own housing, even if it involves taking on large amounts, large amounts of debt. And they still want to do the classic thing of borrowing, whether from a bank or informally based on the rising value of, of their housing. We, us middle class people all do this, uh, but it's even, uh, on people lower on the ladder, that's a, it's an even more prevalent practice uh, everywhere in the world. And uh, uh, we, we want to make sure that there's participation. I think some of the things that, some of these um, green park type redevelopment models where you, where you capture the rising value of the property through sales and funnel it back into the community can be very useful ways to make gentrification work for the, uh, the community that lives in. So a couple big ideas in there, and I'm hoping some of the other panelists will comment on them uh, on them as well. The challenge, I think, with what you're proposing, Doug, is that most of our arrival communities are, in fact, rental. So it's not possible to build equity. And the gentrification is, in fact, only good to the community that lives there if you're an owner. <laughs> if you're not an owner, it means your rent's going, it means your rent's going up, and eventually you're not going to be able to so the challenge we have in Toronto is that most of our arrival communities, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but many of them are in fact uh, rental, so the equity is not something that is going to benefit the, the owner. The other key idea here is, uh, that, I'll, that I'll just throw out, is that we need to be careful when using Regent Park as a model. I think it's a fabulous model for replacing existing housing stock and for urban revitalization, but we did not increase the amount of, of uh, social housing that we have available as a result of Regent Park. And Regent Park isn't a model that was purely a market-based partnership. It involved a tremendous amount of government money in order to replace that rental housing. And uh, we get a lot of pressure in the planning department, well, plan if you just allow the market to take its course, we would replace this, this rental housing. And in fact, that's not true. It, it takes a tremendous amount of government investment at both the federal and provincial level just to replace that housing stock, not to even get to the bigger question of how we, in fact, increase it. So I think there's the, the uh, it's a great form of urban revitalization, but not necessarily a way to be ensuring that we're creating environments where newcomers can become integrated into our communities. I'm wondering if uh, some of the other panelists want to comment on this very important question and idea that Doug has raised around um, generating equity and the importance of being able to generate equity as a new arrival. 
So specifically in terms of um, community revitalization, um, where uh, rental neighborhood is Toronto Community Housing, where in fact public housing and we own it, we can ensure that um, there is replacement housing and that there is no loss of, of unit count um, in uh, revitalization. And Agent Park is a, a, an excellent example of that. The one thing we were able to do was to bring in affordable home ownership programs. So there were certain members of the community who moved into home ownership through, um, through that revitalization. Granted, not, not huge numbers, um, but some um, new equity created in that way. The, the bigger concern is when it's revitalization of privately owned rental housing um, and the ability to um, direct the benefits That's much more of a challenge. I think there's a bit of opportunity when you can achieve it through intensification um, and um, uh, try to achieve some benefits uh, depending on um, how that the approach to intensification. Um, but there are great risks with gentrification. Uh, are we sure that you talk a bit about um, St. Lawrence neighborhood and, and Regent Park? condos where you can buy some units that people can live in. So there are many restrictions in these kind of stuff that separate these uses. Um, I don't have an answer, I'm just saying that we used to have a lot of programs that helped us um, look at issues of housing, whether it's living in poverty or it's quality itself. Uh, we don't have that. We're all very new and mean right now. The legislation is for, for, the, for, for the providers to do much with what they've got. Uh, has, does Toronto Housing or any of the other public housing authorities have, have a pathway for people to buy their rental units? That's something that, that Ted can discuss with you today. I can't speak to the private nonprofit, but for Toronto Community Housing, which I think is two thirds of the social housing stock in the city, um, there are very few. There are some home, home ownership um, programs. They're limited to when we get federal or uh, provincial support. There's also a couple of co-ops, co-op management models that CEH um, has piloted in uh, Alexander Park Action Co-op would be an example of that, but it's, it's somewhat limited. There is certainly a broader conversation that the city is interested in around um, the, the definitions of social housing and social housing levels um, that, that we are uh, doing our best to engage our partners. Well, and it's a very glad you asked that question because that was in fact a theory that Amanda Burden, the chief planner in New York City has and she started her tenure and she just came out a couple of months ago and said we didn't get that right. We thought that just by creating more housing in general that there would be a lot of shifting
we get in the market, which would free up more affordable, and it didn't happen. They increased the amount of housing on the market significantly, and housing has gotten more expensive. That's in fact what we've seen in Toronto as well. So that idea, the challenge is that if you have a desirable city where people want to live, you need to account for the people you're attracting new into the city that are going to keep the market very tight. You're actually increasing the, the, the you're increasing the demand by increasing the supply. That was the, that's what they discovered in New York City, and I think you could probably come to the same conclusion in Toronto because we've been increasing our supply, but our housing prices haven't gone down; they've been going up. Yeah. And our waiting list for assisted housing has not gone down either; it's continued to rise. So even though the housing supply overall is increasing, uh, it's not. It's actually the external market that's being attracted into the city that's creating creating this impact. But interestingly, that was kind of the, you know, for the past 10 years in New York City, that was seen to be as the affordable housing strategy was let's significantly increase our housing stock. And in that way we'll be people will be moving out of that more affordable into more expensive housing, increasing that affordable stock. And the uh, in retrospect the answer is that that didn't in fact happen. I think, though, the notion of figuring out, to Chris's point, I think there's a real interest in figuring out this question of how we can create access to building equity, because it's such an important part of transitioning people uh, into, and, and having that equi equity on a very small scale throughout the city. One of the reasons why the city of Vancouver has embraced this idea of equidentity, meaning that you can turn your garage into a lane house, or you can add second on the back of your house was this idea of not simply allowing new development in the city, meaning that developers with a you know 300 unit building are participating in the boom, but individual people can add density to their own home unit and participate in building equity as a result of the growth that's happening in the city as well. So I think it's an important question. Uh, Joanne, did you want to speak to that? Well, actually, what I wanted to speak to was the real need for us to look at multiple systems at the same time. If we look at just the housing system, we can get it wrong because the economy doesn't cooperate or the, the, the employment opportunities uh, for newcomers for them to buy in to those homes and, and so forth. And Lou mentioned the, the new housing um, isn't there. So it makes me think a little bit about, um, um, you know, your first question when you said, what is the model? I think we look at what we have right now, we provide, um, we make sure that we have power Well, we did have a uh, comment from Councillor Parker on Twitter, and he said, you know, when is everyone going to realize that transit is the silver bullet? And I think that, you know, that's in direct conflict with what you're saying, that there's a whole variety of systems. I think the reality is that there are some that are more influential than others. If you can't, if you can't access or if you can't get on a uh, streetcar or an LRT or a subway, that's a problem. I also have a comment here. It is not a crisis of expectation or entrepreneurial spirit. This is a comment from the floor. It is a crisis of built form. Garden, style, garden city towers were not built for walkable, dense neighbors, and zoning development needs to catch up to the intensity and vibrancy in the communities. And I think, uh, you know, heads are nodding around the table. We know that a built form is a really big piece of the puzzle. And the challenge is that plenty of both management last week, we had a motion around exploring with city planning staff how we can in fact facilitate new development in those communities which need it most. And I was glad to see your map, Chris, mapping out the priority neighborhoods and then where the new development is taking place because it makes it transparent that the places where you really need new development in order to remediate or heal that built form are the places where we're not getting it right now. That we need strong policies 
this one was that directed in that way. Uh, we're almost out of time, and what I'd like to do is just ask all of my panelists if they'd like to say just kind of one key idea that you've learned today that you'd like to throw out to the group just in closing comments. It can be with respect to next steps or something that you heard that was, uh, was inspiring. And Adu, we'll start with you. I just want to say we all learn, we all earn, better to return now. Time for return to the community. Let's return back. Thank you. Well, I would say um, it's a choice. People in the neighborhood would live where they want to live, where they feel comfortable, where they feel connected, and where they feel that they belong. So it's a matter of choice, and we have to follow the choice. Um, I think what we've learned over um, a number of years and really looking to the future is uh, to work in partnerships and um, some unlikely partnerships that we have to um, bring together, but to really be um, having a working towards a common vision of where we want to go to and work in partnerships, recognizing their different roles and supporting each other um, to bring that about. The other thing is that we're talking about newcomers in isolation in some ways, but everything that would impact and help integrate um, newcomers, but also help um, integrate the rest of the city. Um, well, it's been uh, really interesting to be part of this conversation. and. Um, I think one, one comment I want to make is that um, even having this discussion, I think is quite significant and, and a lot of conversations around um, newcomers and settlement and, and inclusion and integration. It's been a real shift in conversation throughout, uh, I would say the country, but um, certainly in the city of Toronto, so yeah, thank you. I must congratulate the city of Toronto in the, in the kind of social service program that you've got here, because it's, it's terrific. Uh, it's an uphill battle all the time. Uh, what you're dealing with are really these suburban communities that are monoculture. And what you're really trying to do with your um, car renewal program and all the other programs is to create complete communities where you have jobs, shops, community services, and all in mixed income neighborhoods that are walkable neighborhoods. To try and turn that from a car-oriented neighborhood to a walkable neighborhood like Thorncliffe is really a challenge. Uh, I would like to thank the chief planner for um, kind of varying the approach to the roundtables and inviting us uh, to be a part of it. Um, I think this is the kind of conversation that will help get us um, a little bit further down the road. I also want to thank my colleague from Markham um, because being the Toronto-centric kind of person that I am, um, it is important to remember that for many of these communities, the linkages may be out, outward from the core, not just um, from the core uh, to the inner suburbs of Toronto. Um, Can I just add something? Uh, the city of Toronto looks at its inner suburbs as the suburbs. <laughs> for us in the 905, the whole 416 is the city. <laughs> Thank you all for giving such a vivid picture of where things stand now in, in the, the larger Toronto, and if you think throughout the amalgamation, you can go quite far enough, and uh, not words that anyone wants to hear here. But uh, uh, if there's any lesson from this, it's, it's that for 50 years, Toronto got lucky, uh, in that it had the right sort of housing in the right sort of places with the right sort of infrastructure already existing to turn a million people from extremely deprived backgrounds into prosperous members of the economic, educational, and political community. But for the 50 years that began at the end of the 20th century, Toronto is not is going to have to be skilled rather than lucky. And I'm pleased to see that the knowledge is there of what skills are needed, and I hope we can find a way to, to make the interventions that are needed to make the next 50 years work. Fabulous. Well, in thinking about this uh, roundtable, I reflected a little bit about um, my story because my parents came here as immigrants when they were children with their families. And my grandfather arrived here and he'd been promised a wonderful job. And the job turned out to be uh, cherry picking. And the job turned out to be seasonal. And he then embarked on many, many years. A big part of that success uh, in transitioning into Canadian society was in fact that they were a part of a community. And that community provided them with all kinds of supports and that community connected them in a whole variety of different ways. And I think at the end of the day, that's the, probably the narrative in the Strand 
that links all of our disciplines together is that we are seeking to build neighborhoods and communities where people feel connected and where people have the opportunity to succeed. I want to thank uh, Doug Saunders, first for writing your wonderful book, which shaped my thinking, and secondly for being here today. I would like to thank all of my panelists uh, for your input and your expertise and the great work that you, you do every day. And I also want to thank you for being here today and enriching our conversation and our thinking. Thank you very much, and I hope to see all of you at our next roundtable. We will be producing an action summary document as an outcome of this roundtable that will be available on the website. And our current summary from our previous roundtables is available on the web light, website. You can just click on it and uh, download it. Thank you all so much for your participation.